friends, this is Reflections, a religious affairs program sponsored by Paducah Cooperative Ministry, where together we do God's work with human hands. It's good to have you with us. I'm Karen Winkle. I pastor United Church of Paducah. I'm one of your co-hosts. Your other co-host is Gregory Waldrop, who is the pastor at Fountain Avenue United Methodist Church. Good to be together, Gregory. As always, glad you all are here with us as well. We have another Bible study and uh, as we've been moving, making our way through the book of Psalms. And with us today are two pastors in the area. We have Zach Browning, who's the pastor at Reedland Christian Church. Welcome, Zach, glad you're here. And we have a, a new pastor in the area now for whom we're glad to connect. Uh, we have Chris Fleming, who's the newly installed pastor at Margaret Hank, yes. Cumberland Presbyterian Church. Thank you for Ask me here. Appreciate it. We're glad you're here, Chris. Thank Tell you. us just a little bit about you, just for a while, uh, and uh, what, what, what your status is these days. I'm officially official now. <laughs> uh, I finished up my seminary in January, and so was ordained January first or January eighth, I think, and then uh, worked on the installation or getting installation because Presbyterians, we got to go from one Presbyterian to the next Presbyterian and be received and confirmed and all that good jazz. So uh, that all got finished and accomplished Sunday night. So I am now the official pastor, I guess, of marketing. Great. Are you a family man? Uh, no. Well, I would hate to say no, I'm not. I might be someday. But uh -huh. <laughs> uh -huh. So you're pastoring single. as a single fellow. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's great. Mm -hmm. Good, good. How about Zach? How, what's going on in Reedland? You oh. share this with us. All kinds of stuff. Getting ready for VBS. Uh, we're looking for a youth minister right now. We're uh, going to be having some interviews this week and uh, really looking forward to that. And uh, just doing uh, doing whatever God calls us to do out there. Who knows what he's going to ask us to do today. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> Well done. We're glad you all are here. Thank Very you. glad. Mm -hmm. well, uh, as Gregory said, we're um, making our way through the Psalms. Today we'll be looking at Psalm 82. And... Um, as I've said before, uh, on these particular studies, we're uh, drawing on a book by um, Eugene Peterson called Where Your Treasure Is, and the psalms, these particular psalms, are kind of to uh, point us outward rather than inward. So the words will appear on the screen. I will read them. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Yours might be a little bit different, <coughs> and that makes uh, the conversation all the richer. God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Give justice to the weak and the orphan. Maintain the right of the lowly and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. They have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk around in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I say, you are gods, children of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, you shall die like mortals and fall like any prince. Rise up, O God, judge the earth, for all the nations belong to you. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. May it come to life in us. Mm, thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Wow. They pack a lot in a short yeah. space mm -hmm. there, huh? Does anybody hear in that? There's a lot. I've, I think it's, uh, it's interesting that the author starts off and says, God presides in the great assembly. Given, you know, right from the get-go in this chapter, we see where God is. He is on the throne, in control. He's the judge. And you know, anything that's said below that is in the context of God is in control. Sometimes it might not seem like it. You know, we, we want him to, to be a little more in control of our lives, maybe control it the way that we want to. But I, I appreciate that the author goes right out of the gate and says, God is there and he is judging. He makes a comment among the gods. And I think that's sort of an underhanded, you know, way of saying, well, he's really in control. There's no other gods besides him. So I, th I, I appreciate that. I like that. When I, when I read this, um, I was kind of taken aback because when we read something like this, we read it almost like a uh, we're happy because we say uh, God's going to come and he's going to stop these wickedness and stop these people who have power and privilege over everybody else. And when we read it, <laughs> it's easy for us to not see us as the people who have privilege and power. And uh, it came to light a couple of weeks ago while I was preaching. We were talking about you know the church as an instrument of, of helping the needy and 
I realized, you know, I'm wearing a $400 robe and <laughs> the collection plates that we use cost $60 a piece, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, we don't see ourselves in this. We see ourselves as the, as the other side. We're, but anyway, it's kind of weird how we, we read what we want to a lot of times. Right, mm -hmm. right, right. Yeah, I was, uh, it, it is always from where you look that <laughs> makes the difference. And I, of course, uh, know the whole history about the American Revolution until I went and studied in Britain. And in Britain, <laughs> they didn't call that the Revolutionary War. They called it the, uh, you know, the uprising of the guerrillas, the guerrilla war for the terrorists. Mm -hmm. And because uh, they were looking at it from a different place sure. than I was looking at it. And uh, so it's an interesting, it, 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 perspective is everything, isn't it? Yes, it mm -hmm. is. I think that perspective really flows in well to that, that verse two where the author is saying, how long will you defend the unjust and show partiality to the wicked? And, you know, in, in some instances we think, well, God, when are you going to do something? You know, all this horrible things are going on. You know, we've got all these epidemics flying around and there's so much danger and hatred and violence in the world. And, you know, when are you going to do something? And, you know, it, in some respects we could be part of that. You know, it's a lot of it is you know, just as you say, it's perspective. You know, you look at yourself and you think, well, you know, we're the needy. We're the ones that really need something. And then you kind of step back for a moment. and You think mm -hmm. we're not really that needy yeah. at all. Right. Mm -hmm. We may be the ones yeah. holding somebody else back. Yeah. I was just reading something this morning um, by uh, Peter Gomes, who uh, has written a number of books. Um, but he was just making the point that. You know, we, there's this uh, difference for us. There's going to our private lives and the faith of our private lives that maybe spills out into you know friendships and associations that we have with people. And then there's our public life and how um, uh, unrelated sometimes those those things are. Um, you know, when I was reading this, you know, I can't help think of all the things that have happened recently. You know, in terms of the economy and the revelation of the depth of greed that oh. ha, you know brought us uh, really to our knees, I think. Um, and you know, the, the the people behind that were not um, you know Satan's spawn. <laughs> these are you know these are people who um, you know in many ways are you know, respected in their communities and, you know, loved by their friends mm -hmm. and all that, but there's something at work yeah. in us that we d have a disconnect between um, what God is asking of us and what we end up doing. Right. Mm -hmm. And th this, this is one of those psalms that kind of lays that bare. Sure. sure. I'm, uh, I'm always intrigued in the psalms when we happen across, and we really, it's really more regular than we realize, these these laments, mm -hmm. you know, we we do a good job with the praise psalms. We in the culture yeah. do a lot of good with the uh, delight and wonder and joy and uh, thanksgiving, but we I think miss out on the importance of lament, yeah. of uh, of a of raging at outrageous situations. I think there's some outrageous situations here he's talking about. Uh, judge unjustly, partiality to the weak, wicked, mm -hmm. justice to the weak and orphaned. Uh, you know, I, I think this is, a, this is a psalm listing and raging at outrageous things. And I think we miss the point here uh, about how important that is if we're not careful. We rush right by it and say, well, you know, we, this, this is somebody crying out to the Lord in agony, in the despair, in unease, certainly in upset. The other thing that's really hard, uh, almost in our culture or society, whatever you want to call it, uh, if a preacher was to preach on these themes on a regular basis, especially Kentucky, Tennessee, you'd be labeled as a crazy hippie type. Uh, and after a while, they just wouldn't care what you say. But then if you don't preach on these, how are you feeding your flock too? You know, right. Because these are huge themes all throughout the scripture. But. And I, th I think it's interesting here that um, you, to really get into what's going on here, the, this is a cry out to God. You have to realize there is a relationship between the psalmist and God that is so close. You know, for me to, to just uh, 
say some of these things today from the pulpit, people would say, well, where do you get off, you know, talking to God in such a way? And you look at this and you see there is a deep relationship. There is that friendship, that father-son, you know, kind of a bond where Trust. he's, yeah. And, and the, the psalmist is crying out saying, you know, I, I want you to do this. You promised us you would. I know you're in control. When's it going to happen? You know, and if we just have kind of a, a passing relationship where, or, you know, kind of a conversational relationship, that's, that's not going to do it. But if we have that deep relationship, you can, you can challenge each other. And mm -hmm. that's really what this psalmist has. And when he cries out, uh, you know, and says, how long will you defend the unjust? How long will you show partiality to the wicked? You know, and then he, he tells them what he would want. You know, defend the cause of the weak and the fatherless, maintain the rights of the poor and the oppressed. That takes a lot of closeness and a serious relationship between someone and God to be able to say this. Because, you know, like you said, if, if we preach these from the pulpit, people are like, well, where's this guy, you know, come around talking to God in such a way. Mm -hmm. or, or people feel um, judged yeah. in, in that. Mm -hmm. And that, um, right. that's a tension for every pastor. Um, as you were speaking... Um, Zach, it just really strikes me th that, you know, the psalmist has within in him the very heart of God, yeah. that his, um, that God's will is alive in him, that God's concerned for all these folks who are, who, who are being overlooked or, or mistreated. That's, that's God's heart and that he has that Mm -hmm. Heart, because he himself may not occupy one of these categories in, in in the world, and that's the challenge in the local church. I think is to begin to understand, you know, what it is that God wants for the world, mm -hmm. and for us to want that as well. But that's it's it's hard to preach that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it is. <clears throat> it's very interesting. Once again, as God shows up, or at least the people of God declare that we have a special responsibility yeah. and God has a special responsibility for the most vulnerable in our society, the most vulnerable in our midst. And he names them, uh, you know, to the weak and orphaned, yeah. the uh, afflicted and the destitute, the weak and the needy. Uh, and he, 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 it's not the first place that that list has been made. Uh, obviously, it, 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 as I've come to understand, it wasn't accidental he picked slaves in Egypt yeah. to uh, actually be the, the channel of God's liberation and freedom and, uh, for the whole world. Mm -hmm. Is that there was something about that, that most vulnerable that is uh, in, in line with what God's working in the world. Or he displays his power the best. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So, or the most. Yeah. Or it, it may even be that they're the they have the least to distract them that could be. from God for whatever reason. God is connected to them. They may have the least to drop and let go of in order to embrace God fully. Mm -hmm. But uh, whatever it is, that's where you can find God. I think God enjoys using that, the weak, the meek, you know, to, to sort of shame the people in power is, you know, by showing this is my power. These people couldn't do it by themselves, you know, by the world standards. But, you know, with me, anything's possible. Yeah. And I, I think he, I, I love to see him do that, you know, love to see him use people that seem to be quiet and meek and they'll stand up and they'll maybe give a communion meditation or have a devotion at church or, you know, be a part of a service. And you think, oh, wow, I can't believe that they, you know, came with that kind of power, you know, and then you you almost have to say that was God. You know, I think he likes that, you know, to be able to okay. use folks and to be able to get glory through it. Yeah. One, one of my favorite illustrations of that is the, uh, the way God used uh, the uh, welder from Gdansk, Poland, named Lech Walesa, mm -hmm. to stand up to the uh, Russian Empire and the Soviet <coughs> Union uh, I'm sure the 82nd Psalm was on his heart. How long? How long? How long will uh, you judge unjustly and partiality to the weak, to the wicked? I'm sure it, uh, he was a he uh, he was a Catholic. He is a Catholic, and uh, he lived out of his faith community. Uh, I think the details are he was after standing up and asking the government of Poland to do what they said they were going to do and to live out their constitution and terms of freedom, he was 
put under house arrest for almost nine years. And uh, then the consequences, uh, the circumstances came back together and he really led this uh, from a very uh, underwhelming place in the society. He led a uh, international revolt, really. Uh, he, he's been to Murray. I saw him. He's one of my heroes of the 20, 20th century, particularly. And he came to Murray a couple of years back, and I, I, was, I saw him and heard him. And uh, I think he was one that God used in, in, the, in the effect of the 82nd Psalm, really. Well, I'm, I'm remembering something that um, Jim Wallace, who's the editor of Sojourner magazine, who has written a number of things and speaks broadly, um, uh, not, uh, not in this administration, but the previous ad administration, um, talked a lot about um, our national budget as a faith document, yeah. that it says what <coughs> is important and who is important. and kind of challenged Christians across the country and around the world really to look at where, you know, so we have, we have certain values and then we live them out in, in other ways. And um, I thought that was a, um, a really a, a beautiful way to invite us to think about, you know, what, uh, what is important and who is important and, and how are our actions synced up with those. Right. And where do we those, look for clues about mm -hmm. What we, what we value and with whom we stand. That's for sure. I think this does a really good job too of not only just you know putting it off on God and saying why haven't you done anything? Why haven't you stood up for for them? Because they drop down rather quickly and it says they know nothing, they understand nothing, they walk in darkness. And then he says, I say you are gods, but yeah. you're the sons of the Most High God. It's our job oh, to, to yeah. you know, witness, to go out and to teach and to preach. You know, it's not just throw it on God. God uses us to, to tell people about his son, yeah. and it's our responsibility. Yeah, I think that's lost because we like to, when something's going bad in society or whatever, we like to throw it on politicians or judges, <laughs> you know, when, call them activist judges, whatever. Uh, yet you are sons of the Most High God. You are also created in God image. What are you doing, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, I know... Uh, me and Dr. Walter up here, we have this whole revitalization neighborhood that we could be stepping into, and your church does a great job on it, and we're trying to, at Margaret Hank, get in our feet. You know, we're God's viceroy, so to speak. We're judges for these people, and are we doing what we're supposed to do? And, you know, it, it's really hard to... I don't know how as preachers we can make... We can't make people have this heart of God, for sure, and it's hard to make ourselves have this heart of God, yeah. so... Uh, just to preach these themes, I guess, mm -hmm. is, is how mm -hmm. keep preaching, keep studying, keep praying for this heart and see what happens, I guess. I know. And you, you talked about kind of putting it off on politicians and other mm -hmm. people, and we, we have a real tendency to say, oh, well, it's the government's fault, yeah, or they, you know, look at the way that they are. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, turn that back on us. Is that we, we get on, uh, you know, an administration for spending billions of dollars in a particular place, and then we look at our budget, yeah. and we're, you know, thousands of dollars in debt on credit card because we can't wait. You know, I, I was able to preach on that this past Sunday. I've been reading some of uh, Dave Ramsey's Total Money Makeover, and it's so, so much like we're little kids kicking and screaming with our red face saying, I have to have what I want right now. And, you know, the reason that some people are oppressed, the reason that some people are, you know, looked down upon and are weak and in need is because they put themselves in that position, yeah. you know? And it's like, we, we fall into that category, but it's our own fault. It's not that God's forsaken us. It's the fact that we've went out to everywhere and swiped that credit card. We've, you know, not been willing to wait a little bit longer to, to save some money up to have a down payment. We want it now, now, now. And then, you know, we're paying for it in interest. We're paying for it in the stress that it puts on our family and our friends and you know it's just uh, it's amazing to see that even though we're so far ahead time wise and financial wise oh, and yeah. technology wise they were dealing with the same things back <laughs> right. then you Doesn't know change much. no not a bit <laughs> so sin and salvation are still a pretty basic operating level for mm -hmm. us yeah. humans isn't it? that's for sure that's for sure well I'm thinking um, you know the size of our community it, it relates to this and our awareness and our caring for those who are the most vulnerable. To, uh, in some ways, the larger the community, the easier it is to not see right. when you're living in a little tiny place, you know, the, you, you know most of the folks and you mm -hmm. know their circumstances and their struggles. I had a conversation um, not long ago with somebody 
about um, a, a church that was selling fair trade coffee, yeah. and um, which is uh, coffee that's been, uh, the, the growers and the harvesters are being compensated fairly okay. as opposed to unfairly by, you know, the big Plainly, yeah. coffee companies, but the, the um, ladies in the kitchen didn't want to use the fair trade coffee because it was very expensive and the, right. you know, mm -hmm. the big things of, you know, Folgers or whatever were uh, inexpensive. And I said, well, the, you know, the reason that that happens is because those ladies don't know anybody who's harvesting the mm -hmm. coffee. And, the, and because um, we're disconnected, um, out of relationship with people who are struggling or suffering, it's, it, it makes it easier for us in some respects, I think, to um, not relate and for these things to be theoretical rather than practical. When we feel someone suffering, sure. um, then yeah. we're moved. Yeah, my, the founder of Methodism, John Wesley, in the uh, 1700s, he had an, uh, a maxim that he insisted and enforced and that was, never send your charity, take your mm -hmm. charity. If you are going to, uh, to deliver something, you look people in the eye, you get acquainted, yeah. you, the relationship that's established is maybe more important than yeah. the charity itself. So I've, our, uh, our children's minister has been doing an excellent job of that. Karen Mathis has been taking our kids. Uh, they've been doing outreach into the community and Paducah Cooperative Ministry takes some uh, foodstuffs, you know, non-perishable foods and things like that. And they were able to make some uh, Easter baskets for some of the families in the uh, transitional homes that they have. And were actually on Wednesday night took those Easter baskets to the house. Didn't just send them, didn't just have them drop them off during the week, but gave them over to the families and were actually able to to see who Paducah Cooperative was ministering to, to see some of the things that were going on, and to have a better idea of, rather than just me saying, we've done this for Paducah Cooperative Ministry, yeah. those kids saw what that ministry was about. And mm -hmm. I think so many people need to be a part of that. And when they do, their eyes begin to open to what you know God can be doing mm -hmm. and oftentimes how fortunate they are to where maybe they're not that you know needy. Maybe there's some other folks that they can help and turn things around for. Mm -hmm. It's really easy to uh, sit in your session meeting and say, well, we're going to give X amount of money to the cooperative ministry or we're going to give X amount of ministry to, you know, whatever ministry. And you do all your ministry in the boardroom, right? And <laughs> that's easy, easy to do. Yeah. So I think this calls us back to what you were saying, you know. Back to relationship. One of my favorite uh, mission experiences was a trip to a Native American reservation in North Dakota. And uh, in the course of our ministering with uh, the folks there, I said, you know, next year we will have a mission in Paducah and maybe some of you all would like to come down. I thought we'd get a, maybe a van load if we could. 33 awesome. youth came down. That's good. With adult chaperones. And we had, and then they in return ministered to us in all sorts of wonderfully special ways and it uh, really it was it has been a highlight of a lot of things That's awesome. yeah Very what else is there we're getting close to the edge of our time frame anything else we don't want to miss I think uh, a lot of people can take things out of context and uh, people can really dwell on six. I said you're gods and yeah. you're all the sons of the Most High God. And that's, a, that's an excellent thing to take with a lot of humility that we yes. are part of the family mm -hmm. and not that, well, I'm a, I'm a son of the Most High God. You know, I, I can do yeah. what I want. I First can, seven tempers it pretty well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you will die like mere men. And uh, you just have to read on. And that's so many people take things out of context. My, my favorite one is uh, what Paul said, anything is permissible. Now you have to read on where he said not everything's beneficial, but you know, and, and get that. But you know, you can take things completely out of context, but it's so neat how the author says these bold statements, you know, in the face of God because of that tight relationship that they have, mm -hmm. and then comes back and tempers it really well, like you said in verse yeah. seven, but you'll die like mere men. You know, you'll fall like every other ruler. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I've noticed that some of the most pious people in history, Martin Luther or uh, Augustine, they'll say some just wildly crazy stuff, but it's because they are so close to God yeah. and they're not misinterpreting it. Mm -hmm. you know? Right. Sure. Uh, 
So yeah, what sounds maybe odd at times after just a little bit of experience, it right. makes yeah. great sense. One of my favorites, sin boldly, but believe more boldly still. Yeah. And it's only the person who struggled over sin can say that, you know, yeah. uh, for Martin Luther. So that's true. Well, it ends with that great, uh, great statement of faith, like it began. Mm -hmm. Oh, arise, O oh God, judge the earth, for to you belong all the nations. Mm -hmm. It is into the hands of this uh, loving, righteous, holy, just God that uh, the psalmist sees us finding our, our way and our peace, our rest. And it's into that same God we give ourselves and all these that have have studied with us today. Mm -hmm. So glad you all have been with us. It's good to be Thank you. Uh, very good to have you in our community and for all that you're doing and certainly here in our Bible study as Thank well. You. Chris Fleming, Zach Browning, thanks. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Glad to be with you. Good to be with you. Thanks for joining us today here on Reflections. Do join us again. You can also check us online at uh, paducah2.org. All the programs for this season are archived there. Thank you for joining us and do join Paducah Cooperative Ministry in doing God's work with these human hands. Shalom. 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 In mission,